Bob is about to give his fifth presentation for this weekend, Carl Hess and the Love of Liberty. Well, <clears throat> I started thinking about this shortly after lunch. <laughs> And uh, somebody brought up, I don't know why, uh, one of my favorite animals. I guess I brought it up. We have about seven hawks who live on our land. And in watching them, <clears throat> I've often been conscious of something I hadn't, been, I hadn't thought about much before, but that fits into the subject this afternoon, the difference between adoration and love. And uh, there are these hawks. And when I look at them, I understand that if I had one of them to dis disassemble, I would really adore the engineering. Because you've got to admit that they're really, they're terrific uh, things. They're great flyers. And you can sort of adore the way they're I, I aerodynamically fluid and all of that. But there's something else about those hawks. And that doesn't have anything to do with their engineering. It's when you watch them, what I think is you love them. And you're passionately absorbed in, in the fluidity of their flight. <clears throat> and you wish you could be one or spend more time with them. I, I begin to think that there's this great difference between adoration and love. I, I, see, I know a lot of people who adore, I adore my, my Macintosh. It's turning into love, as a matter of fact. Uh, but there is this a, ver a great difference. People adore uh, occasionally leaders, for instance, and this gets them into endless, endless problems. Uh, loving is altogether different. I, I'm trying to think of what love is because I want to talk about it, and it does seem to me that it involves this passionate absorption in something. For instance, you may, uh, you may adore the fact that there is music in the world, and possibly uh, the modern forms of scoring it, but you really love the music itself. When you listen to music, it's, it's <clears throat> despite what I've been told by many people, it doesn't strike me that it's an altogether rational uh, process, that you simply respond to it uh, viscerally. That when I listen to music, I've discovered I don't really see text and pictures. I don't see programmatic things. It doesn't, uh, uh, if it hadn't been named the great gate at Kiev, I would never see a great gate when the thing was played and so forth. But I love, I love the music the way I love just being out in the woods or, uh, or many other things. So the, first of all, a distinction between love and adoration. I'm very much in favor of love. Adoration I find uh, very useful for uh, the relationship to, to machine tools and to uh, the principles of science and that sort of thing. But now, about this love business in general. Uh, specifically, loving liberty is different from adoring it. And I hope I understand this so I can explain it. I've just really started thinking about it. I think you adore a liberty <clears throat> when you understand all of its theoretical uh, implications and you can defend it uh, in, in that way. And that is, that's exciting sometimes. And it's, uh, it puts you in a reverential uh, position in regard to liberty. But there's something beyond that. I'm convinced, and that's passion. Absolute passionate love of it. The way you love music. You feel better when you're doing it. You, you respond to it the way you do <clears throat> to music. Your life is, is lightened and and made graceful uh, by it. And its absence uh, makes things dark and clumsy and heavy. And uh, I'm not too sure that I can, or that I or anyone can say much more than they feel that way. All of the other, the adorations of it, the theoretical explications of it, uh, the defense of it are ingenious. I think there's no question about that. And the practical, adoration of it. Of course, it produces, it, it has a, a most practical justification. People produce more. They have more. There's, 
there's everything materially satisfying about it, <clears throat> but to my view, ultimately, it is this, this feeling you have when you are not free, and it is hateful, and this loved, this loving feeling you have when you are free, and it, it has been true of me at any rate that I've very often not known what the hell I was talking about in, in, in year after year. But I've never been confused by the fact that when people were telling me what to do, I, I felt bad. And when I was doing what I wanted to do, working at something I wanted to work at, I felt good. And I can, I can give a I think all of us can give explanations for this, but I, I honestly believe it is irrational. Uh, I hate to suggest that anything in your life should be, but I and you know that many things in your life are totally irrational. Um, I feel this to be the case, and so you must be warned that you're, you're, you're listening to, uh, probably as an affront to some of your basic principles, a person who is uh, largely irrational in, in his, some of his activities. Certainly the love of liberty. It's, it doesn't, doesn't pay, really, in my case, it's been rather counterproductive. Uh, materially, it's, uh, it's a great inconvenience in some ways, and yet I honestly would rather live uh, in a cave in Papua and be free than uh, be unfree living in a penthouse in New York City and having some idiot telling me what to do all day long. Now, I don't think that's uh, terribly rational. It's just, it's, a, it's an emotion. So I'm in love with liberty. I just love it. I'd do anything to, to achieve it and maintain it. And I have, <clears throat> and nothing else uh, is terribly important uh, to me in, in that broad theoretical range. There are, I think, for free people, three things that they need to do. Well, I think that they need to grow rich, which is to say simply they need to, to uh, add to, their, uh, to the ambit of their life the, uh, the many things that enhance it. This is wealth, whether it's money or, or tools or flowers, who knows what it is. I think that's good to prosper. I think uh, to do good work, that's something else. I believe that uh, uh, however you define it, that creativity is something that human beings do uniquely on this planet and that it's, it's something most want to do. So to grow, to prosper, to do good work, and finally to be in love. It seems to me that's about all there is uh, uh, to things. Now, you could be in love with your work. That's good and you should be. Uh, you can certainly be in love with the processes of prospering. That's, uh, that should be, too. There's this other thing that I swear, and maybe it's, it's sort of embarrassing, I'm told, to even talk about it, but I think being in love with a person is, uh, is crucially important. Not mandatory. I don't think you should have to sign a pledge that you're going to fall in love uh, or anything like that to be a libertarian, but it seems to me that people do it. They fall in love. They become passionately absorbed with another person. Uh, and is it altogether rational? Well, you can you can say that you know you've made the most rational decision. You found the ideal person who shares your values. And blah blah blah. blah and you've made it. You've signed a contract that you you love each other. You've done all the properly rational things. And I suspect that in the back of most people's minds is the fact that what happened was you turned a corner. You saw someone, and your life changed, and that you have been passionately absorbed by that, that person ever since. And I think it transforms your life in the most constructive way. Among other things, it, 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 it means that as you, sh you shed, or if you're forced ever to shed uh, other, other things, that there's always this, uh, this thing that, there will, that will be there. Now, of course, the person can die. And, there are some people who say, well, this is terrible. If you fall passionately, if you are passionately in love and the person dies, then where are you? You're stuck. So the best thing to do is to never, never be involved like that because it, it can be taken away. Well, of course it can. You didn't have it, this love previously to it. You may not have it uh, for long, but while you have it, it certainly seems to me transforming and desirable. And it has been so to me, and, 
and it does other extraordinary things. And this may seem a detail, but uh, to me it's not. And of course, I'm, I'm speaking specifically of, of the woman with uh, whom I am uh, in love, Therese, uh, the, the other part of my life. It, it permits, and I found this to be unusual, it permits you to have other relationships which are like being, being in love with uh, that are uh, become unthreatening and un, uncomplicated and, and very uh, and very wonderful unconniving unmanipulative because you, you your own love is so is so rooted and so secure that uh, uh, it can't be shaken and this, for, among other things I've found, this is very curious, I found that being so incredibly in love with one woman, I'm able to have the most rewarding and wonderful friendships with other women without uh, feeling that there is a, a compromise or a complication. And I'm not too sure that this is always possible unless you are uh, singularly in love also, because then relationships uh, can become uh, manipulative and, and exploitive. Well, I don't know if that's terribly important, but it's something that occurs to me as being interesting. At any rate, now what do we do about this, uh, this, this situation of being in love? Uh, can, can you be in love with somebody who doesn't love liberty? Well, that's a complication that I think needs to be uh, seriously considered. I mean, this isn't, I don't mean that everything is totally irrational in your life. I, I, I believe that, well, it's like this. Suppose you had a a large house, and the large house was a, a great uh, anchor on you. You, the, you. you were no longer free because the maintenance of this large house uh, required that you compromise and that you constantly uh, bind yourself uh, to other people's activities simply to maintain the house, <clears throat> which you find attractive and which gives you pleasure and status and so forth. Well, that's, that's an uncomfortable imprisonment to me. And the same, suppose you were uh, in love with a person who uh, didn't share your values of liberty and who wanted to chain you nevertheless to, to this love uh, by, and, and would deny uh, the various things necessary to liberty. I think it would be a terrible situation and uh, would be like maintaining a large house uh, because of its view or something of that sort. So I think that's important too. I don't know if you can avoid falling in love with, <laughs> with people who don't like liberty, but uh, it's something to keep in mind. To be suspicious of it, you right? I mean, if, uh, and there are probably signs of this if you fall in love with you know, somebody who uh, is constantly talking about uh, their big house or shopping malls or something. Uh, you might want to wonder what this is going to lead to because the, the adventure of liberty, I believe, requires that at any given moment you be prepared to give up a number of other things. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the crux of it, of the whole thing that I've said over and over and will say over and over again that the song is correct. Having nothing less left to lose is being free. And so long as you feel that you have other things to lose besides your freedom, you're likely to give up uh, your freedom easily in order to retain those other things. And uh, you have to come to grips with this in your own life. How much, uh, how much of it will you give up in order to practice liberty? It's a decision everybody makes. It's a decision everybody can make. This is a wonderful thing. I suppose specifically about living in this country, of all countries on the face of the earth. Look. I know that it is, it is standard libertarian practice, and I do it too. America bashing is <clears throat> the most fun of anything, that you, except maybe for Christian bashing. <laughs> <laughs> but America bashing is just wonderful fun. I mean, it, the, the, the things stand out so brilliantly. One of the reasons they stand out so brilliantly is that they stand out. Now, you can go any place. I was in Canada last week. My God, I mean, they, they talk roughly the same language. Uh, they're, they're roughly the same cultures and all. Damn place, a police state. It really is. You realize as you cross the border, you've, you've entered into another terrible world. 
whose police powers are so great, we wouldn't put up with Ed Meese, probably wouldn't. <laughs> he was observed buying a, a red jacket and a Smokey the Bear hat the other day. But the, uh, uh, the, the difference is so great. Living here, is, it, this is the greatest miracle. I think that so many dissidents happen to live, live in America. We don't hear about them in other places, I guess. But here we are, and we do have these choices. These choices. We can, we can trade back and forth. We can say, no, liberty is not terribly important. I won't work for it. I won't give up anything for it. I'll just, you know, it's, it's incidental. Or you can make the decision. That's all I want to do. Just want to be free. I, I met an airline pilot recently who said, I'd give it all up for one day as a hawk, back to the hawks again. And I understand that feeling, and that's my feeling about liberty. I'd give it all up, I don't care what it is, but I know I'd give it up just so I didn't have to listen to some idiot telling me what to do. And so I didn't have to live in a room with bars and all of this sort of thing. I'd give it all up. And he goes, what else is important? So, <clears throat> so this is, I believe, an attribute of love, that it is, it is wildly irrational when you get right down to it. Of anybody, any, there are many people in this room who are passionately in love with somebody, and if any one of them honestly can write down on a piece of paper all of the rational reasons, and then give me a rational reason why they would give up everything else in the world uh, to maintain this, I'd love to see it, because I'm not too sure that I know I couldn't do it. And I'd, I've never read any convincing statement by anyone as to why this phenomenon occurs. Yet it does occur. And there we are, and I think it's a great blessing. So, in love with a person, in love with work, <clears throat> in love with liberty, this is, uh, sums it all up, it seems to me. And uh, I don't know, uh, I'd go on and on about it, but why, why should I? That's. Uh, that's the simple fact, uh, by my observation. And now uh, I think we should discuss it, if, if you want to. Uh, does anybody care to? Yes. Well, um, this is a phenomenon that I've noticed over a period of many years in, uh, in reference to libertarianism, politics, movement. And that is, there, there is a dramatically higher percentage of men Mm -hmm. involved in it mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure why that is um, do you have thoughts um, sure because there's more I don't know but I think I can explain the phenomenon and that is that there's more adoration uh, here than love I mean people uh, often are, are here to ex to really uh, extol themselves on the basis of whom they adore I mean, they're, they're, they're people describe, you know, it really is rather interesting, isn't it, that just as there are people who describe themselves as Marxists, if you sometimes you ask a person, what are you, P possibly expecting to get the, the answer that I'm a Lakota Sioux or a West Virginian, instead you, you get the answer, I'm a, a Misesian or a Hayekian or something like that. Well, this is incredible, it seems to me. How can you be such a person? What does this mean? Do you, do you get up differently? Do you? <laughs> what? what uh, this is adoration. Now I understand the adoration. I adore Ludwig von Mises. I adore Friedrich von Hayek. I adore them. I don't love them at all. And I'm not them. Nor are they me. They don't determine my character or my personality. I'm not a them. I'm not an ist. In that sense. So I think women understand that coming into the, as they see the Libertarian Party, what they see is this adoration. They see a bunch of men who have banners and suits of chain mail, and they stand there uh, with their banners flying and their chain mail impenetrable, impenetrable chain mail, and they say, I am a Mazesian. You know, and, and the woman can say, well, yes, but you're, you're, you're also a slob. <laughs> And might we discuss that? <laughs> and I think it's it's re it's repellent to a lot of them. <laughs> they don't care what the hell is all of this stuff. They want they want to get on with the the world, and uh, and with loving things like liberty. 
Anyway, libertarian uh, it describes the people who love liberty. It doesn't describe much else about them. And I think a lot of women might be attracted to the idea of freedom. I mean, particularly if it is, it is made clear that the libertarians honestly believe, if in fact they do, that women are fully human uh, in, in nature and activity, and that their, their concerns, although often different from the concerns of men, are crucially important. And so that when a woman speaks, and speaks in, in passionate or psychological terms, well, you know what happens very often, and it's getting better all the time. But in, in many instances, libertarians will sort of nod off, because the woman's talking about passion and about love, and the libertarians want to hear adoration. They want to know where do they stand on uh, the fixed price of gold, and so forth. And so I can understand that. I don't think it should be a great mystery. Add passion to this. Add discussions of the psychology of communications. Jan Prince's commu uh, little talk yesterday afternoon, so different and so, uh, so, to, so appealing and important to talk about the way people feel. People do feel things, and uh, it's so much better. I, I don't know how far back uh, your, any of your attendance at libertarian meetings goes, but mine goes fairly far back. I've, I've just been a libertarian party member for a year and a half or something, but I've been doing liberty-prone things for a long time. And there were times when the meetings were just uh, were in, absolutely intolerable. I mean, you, could, you couldn't get a single irrational thought in with a shoehorn. <laughs> Nor could you get an original thought in. Everything had to be founded in, in a second-hand way upon who said it. Did Ayn Rand say it? Did von Mises say it? Did Rothbard say it? Did Hayek say it? So forth and so on. Those were the important things that were discussed. And if somebody had a, a curiosity or an intuition, God, intuition. <laughs> Forget it, because this is, and, and women often have intuitive flashes that should be listened to. We all should have them, and I think we all do. Men just happen to be a little more shy about it. I mean, how many men, there are men in this room who, you could put them in thumb screws and ask them what they thought about something, and they, God would tell you endlessly, as their thumbs dropped off, they would quote somebody else. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, uh, you know, there's a, a Kipling wrote a poem called Tomlinson about some poor schmuck, schmuck who never had an opinion of his own. And the devil, he's, he's now the devil's got, he's died and the devil's interviewing him, and he's, 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 he's supposed to have sinned. And the devil says, well, tell me about these big sins. How, I mean, did you dare come down here? Does he say, to sleep with my gentleman? And Tomlin says, says well, he had an irreverent thought. The devil said, that, I don't care about your irreverent thoughts. What have you done? How have you sinned? And Tomlinson keeps coming up with all these secondhand things. And, and the devil says, "Don't the race that is run, the race that is run two by two is one is you know, the race that is something two by two is one, is run one by one, meaning that this business of, of collectivized life of your having somebody else's opinions is not important. Finally, finally, there has to be you. You remember uh, in a Man for All Seasons that 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 little turd who was." Uh, betraying uh, the, the, everybody, and, and uh, the man for all of is Thomas Beckett, wasn't it? And Thomas uh, asks him at one po point, if there wasn't some point in his entire ratty little life that wasn't just him, because this guy kept talking about uh, other leaders and he owed his allegiance to the king and this, that, and, and Beckett said, but what about you? Where, where are you? And that uh, struck me as being, that, that's the kind of question a woman would ask immediately. I remember when I was, I'll get to you in just a second, pardon me, but when I was with Goldwater, and uh, I knew Therese then, and, and uh, I used to come to, to see her after 
big important stuff. We just decided to have a policy on something. And she would say, often, she'd say, what's so good about war? Uh, because we're always talking about having wars. And I'd say, I honestly said this. This is why for eight years she didn't see me. Uh, I'd say, if you knew what I knew, you wouldn't ask those questions. You know, and, and I think there has often been uh, a sense of that in, in the Libertarian Party. Women are always bringing up these silly questions. Uh, uh, and if they knew as much as we knew, of course, what we know is what? We know every single thing that three or four people have written. <laughs> what a rich life. <laughs> Now, these are, these are uh, imperishably great writings. There's no question about that. But I keep being reminded, what about us? Where, where is just us, alone with our own thoughts? And I think that's a feminine sort of feeling. And maybe that's it. And it's getting better. It's getting better. There are more women here than I suppose ever before in history. And maybe there'll be another one next year. <laughs> And maybe we'll all start addressing some of these these, these other questions. Yeah. Uh, I disagree with you that uh, emotion is irrational. I think the emotions are uh, are very rational and part of a rational process. Uh, oh. And uh, <laughs> that's not an original idea. Yeah. <laughs> is, it, is it possible that it's an opinion strongly held? Wow, I, uh, I recommend that you refer to Nathaniel Brandon, yeah. the other libertarian yeah. psychologist. Uh, it's uh, a very important part of uh, rational, rational thoughts. And rational well, I suppose it is. I admire Brandon very much. And uh, uh, I just tell you this, that if you, if you listen to Beethoven rationally, uh, ho-hum for you. I don't understand that. <laughs> I honestly don't understand it. And the fact that Nathaniel Brandon can say that, oh, but it is rational, uh, is not binding on me. Well, his, his ideas aren't original either. <laughs> Whether they're original or not, I, 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 I stand uh, prepared to dispute them and to say simply no uh, in terms of my own observation of life. But I appreciate well, the I think uh, that attitude is part of the attitude of, uh, that makes the libertarians uh, such a large percentage of men. No. In other words, it, the, the, the true, uh, the feminine virtue would be to uh, accede, to, uh, to say, I read it, therefore it is. Uh, I don't know. The women tend to be involved in uh, careers and professions that, that deal with uh, communication and psychology. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think that's true. I think that's true, but uh, <clears throat> maybe I'm getting intuition mixed up with uh, with irrational uh, things or something. I don't, I don't think intuition is all irrational either. Uh, well, if I say that everything in my life is rational, will that simply be enough? <laughs> <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's it. Everything I do in my life is absolutely rational. And it's easy to say. And it has no meaning. And I'm not too sure. See, I, I, I well, this is an endless debate, isn't it? Uh, I say tomatoes, and you say tomatoes. <laughs> I guess we just do what we, we do. Yeah. Well, I have a few non-original thoughts, but I've arranged them in original way. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, my first is um, you're referring to us libertarians as people who uh, read and quote Ayn Rand as the Bible, so to speak, and um, other things. But one of the characters I thought of when you were talking about that was Peter Keating. Mm -hmm. And it's... It seems kind of funny. The reference that connected in my mind is we might be playing Peter Keating um, in The Fountainhead, except instead of playing him to Ellsworth Tilly, we're playing him to Anne Rand. 
Well, I, um, yeah, I, how I would we avoid that? I mean, I hope I didn't appear to single her out as, as being uniquely uh, uh, responsible for this. Oh, no, no, I'm just using that as a point. And I'm asking, how can we avoid being that type of other directed libertarian or other thinking libertarian? Do you have any suggestions? By, by understanding that, uh, first of all, you, you, have, uh, you have independent reason. You, you have an intellect of your own. Uh, that opinions strongly held are simply that, opinions strongly held. And that giving names to things doesn't make them uh, change their, their essential nature. And that uh, we all get ideas from all over the place, just as the originators of most other ideas do. And that perhaps uh, the best way to avoid it is simply not to identify our whole personalities and characters with somebody else's uh, system of thought that uh, we, we have the responsibility to move on beyond that, to use the tools that are there, uh, to refine them to our own use, and, and to move on. That's the only way I can think of to do it, is, yeah. Who can we encourage more people to love liberty enough so that whenever they are up against a problem, to search for solutions within liberty, not the immediate around the government or some kind of anti-liberty? Mm. How, how can you, how can you? Mm. It's a hell out of me. Uh, I, the best thing I can think of to do is to do it. Uh, tell people you're doing it, let them see you do it. If it works, somebody may uh, decide that it's okay. Uh, I don't, again, rational argument is a, is a tempting uh, notion, but since you rarely argue with anybody who respects the idea, otherwise they wouldn't be arguing with you, would they? They'd already be there. <laughs> I mean, we're so sure of this, this position that we can say that. So I think its example is, is terribly important. And, and recalling to people uh, incidents from their own experience. Everybody has experiences in which they have been happier when free than when not free, when more has been done. And so I think you need to, uh, Jan spoke of that last night, you need to find out about uh, other people's roadmaps, reality, and find some place on that roadmap where they've had an experience of, of freedom, of liberty, and, uh, and you can have something to talk about. Can you give us some feedback on the project that you know of? Well, I don't know about Mary Margaret's project. She will certainly tell you about that. Of, of really large projects, the one that I think at the moment may be the most, well, of course, science. All science is a major project. Everything that happens uh, uh, in, in, uh, in science and in technology uh, uh, changes the world. And so that's all important. But in, so, in social projects, I think at the moment the most important one I can think of is Leon Lowe's uh, crusade in South Africa uh, to lead the country toward uh, options, uh, independent options for cantons in South Africa that would include uh, an option for a free market area as well as one for a Marxist-Leninist canton a, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. I think this is enormously exciting and, and there's some empirical evidence to support that excitement because indeed the, uh, uh, the fairly simple act of writing a new constitution for the Siskai has certainly produced a change in the Siskai which seems at this point to be pro-libertarian. That is this this most wretched of, 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 uh, of areas in South Af in Southern Africa, uh, by simply adopting a, uh, a rigorous support of the free market, has advanced uh, uh, greatly. If, uh, Leon Lowe, uh, L-O-U-W, has written a book called The Solution, which is the, currently the best-selling book in South Africa and is interestingly endorsed by Winnie Mandela and by uh, Chief Budalese of the Zulu. And uh, I don't know about Bishop Tutu. 
uh, at all, but it has tremendous support, and its, its proposal is that South Africa avoid the uh, bloodbath that will accompany the current situation. If it just goes on the way it is, it'll be one of the bloodiest uh, uh, things in, in African history. And uh, his suggestion is that there be, a, 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 in, in effect, a national plebiscite, I guess, in which people would vote uh, for uh, regions to become uh, independent. Uh, uh, he calls them cantons after the Swiss system, and in which the form of social arrangement in that would be voted on at the same time, assuming that the uh, the ANC, uh, in fact, represents a, a socialist uh, a position that the ANC would have a canton. And that the, uh, the Zulu, being a, uh, with Budalese, if he does represent them fairly, would uh, opt for a free market canton. And that there would be a place for Boers. Uh, so there would be a white canton. And so forth. And that this way, with some federal sharing of, of uh, sort of territorial defense, uh, that this way they might be able to live in peace for a while, instead of, uh, as will be inevitable at the present pace, uh, instead of uh, a lar really large-scale slaughter. And people who just can't wait for that slaughter in Africa because they hate the Boers so much are, I, I just believe, are cruelly disillusioned. It's not going to be easy. I've worked in South Africa and, and in Rhodesia, and uh, I've been a landowner in Rhodesia, and I feel I know something about that area. And I know this, that to go into war with the South African army at this point, no matter the numbers of the people opposing them, is a reckless adventure. There will be hundreds of thousands of people killed. And it would be preferable, it seems to me, to settle it peacefully. And of course it has to be settled so that Europeans uh, give up a lot. But not everything, not everything. I mean, a lot of Europeans uh, living in Africa consider themselves Africans. They've been there long enough. They've, they've done enough. They've, uh, they've worked that land for a time. To just think of evicting them is, uh, it seems to me, reckless. So I think Leon Lowe's uh, proposition is incredibly important. It could mean that there would be a, a, a place in the world where there were competing social organizations side by side. I mean, Hong Kong is a, is a great example, but my God, it's not next to anything. It's just sort of sitting out there. But if you had in South Africa these competing social arrangements, how exciting it would be. It would just be wonderful. I intend to ask uh, uh, Leon to send me a, a copy of the Siskai Constitution because I think it would be very appropriate to the third world country in which I currently live, which is West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I think that's the biggest and most exciting one I can think of. So. Oh, no, that's not fictitious. In Leon, in doing the research for this book, discovered that there had been one homeland in, in South Africa that had once had a constitution with, one, with a one-line content. It had simply the single sentence, there shall be no government. <laughs> well, now, you know, I understand that, uh, I, I don't know how many of you have lived or worked with, uh, with boars in your life, but... <laughs> They can be terribly unpleasant people, and uh, I don't uh, offer the notion that South Africa has been the, the fountainhead of libertarian thought <laughs> or anything, but the fact that it has Leon Lowe in it at this point means it may be one of the most potentially important libertarian projects. Imagine Mary Margaret's project is magnified to a, to a national scale. I mean, what they're saying is that there should be a place in South Africa where those who believe in, in, uh, in the free market can, uh, can go. And I think in South Africa it wouldn't be a thousand, it would be many thousands. Big deal. Well, I, uh, I really appreciate this, and I appreciate particularly your reserving un until the uh, last part this most important thing. Uh, my current favorite saying uh, which has been my current favorite saving since about two issues back of analog, 
uh, is, uh, I have it all over the place now, is this. A man who is about to tell the truth should keep one foot in the stirrup. Old Mongolian saying. <laughs> and I feel that telling the truth about my life, which is that it is irrational, and it is filled with passions, and that it is based upon a love of both liberty and a woman, uh, I'm glad to have one foot in the stirrup and I'll now gallop off. <laughs> just being out in the woods or, uh, <clears throat> or many other things. So the, first of all, a distinction between love and adoration. I'm very much in favor of love. Adoration I find uh, very useful for uh, the relationship to, to machine tools and to uh, the principles of science and that sort of thing. But now, about this love business in general. Uh, Specifically, loving liberty is different from adoring it. And I hope I understand this so I can explain it. I've just really started thinking about it. I think you adore a liberty when you understand all of its theoretical uh, implications and you can defend it uh, in, in that way. And that is, that's exciting sometimes. And it's, uh, it puts you in a reverential uh, position in regard to liberty, but there's something beyond that. I'm convinced, and that's passion. Absolute passionate love of it. The way you love music. You feel better when you're doing it. You, you respond to it the way you do <clears throat> to music. Your life is, is lightened and, and made graceful uh, by it. And its absence uh, makes things dark and clumsy and heavy. And uh, I'm not too sure that I can, or that I or anyone can say much more than they feel that way. All of the other, the adorations of it, the theoretical explications of it, uh, the defense of it are ingenious. I think there's no question about that. And the practical adoration of it, of course, it produces it, it has a, a most practical justification. People produce more. They have more. There's, there's everything materially satisfying about it. <clears throat> but to my view, ultimately, it is this, this feeling you have when you are not free and it is hateful and this loved, this loving feeling you have when you are free. And it, it has been true of me at any rate that I've very often not known what the hell I was talking about. In, in, in year after year. But I've never been confused by the fact that when people were telling me what to do, I, I felt bad. And when I was doing what I wanted to do, working at something I wanted to work at, I felt good. And I can, I can give, a, I think all of us can give explanations for this, but I, I honestly believe it is irrational. Uh, I hate to suggest that anything in your life should be, but I and you know that many things in your life are totally irrational. Um, I feel this to be the case, and so you must be warned that you're, you're, you're listening to, uh, probably as an affront to some of your basic principles, a person who is uh, largely irrational in, in his, some of his activities. Certainly the love of liberty. It's, it doesn't, doesn't pay. Really, in my case, it's been rather counterproductive. Uh, materially, it's, uh, it's a great inconvenience in some ways. And yet, I honestly would rather live uh, in a cave in Papua and be free than uh, be unfree living in a penthouse in New York City and having some idiot telling me what to do all day long. Now, I don't think that's uh, terribly rational. It's just, it's, it's an emotion. So I'm in love with liberty. I just love it. I'd do anything to, to achieve it and maintain it, and I have, <clears throat> and nothing else uh, is terribly important uh, to me in, in that broad theoretical range. 
There are, I think, for free people, three things that they need to do. Well, I think that they need to grow rich, which is to say simply they need to to uh, add to their uh, to the ambit of their life the uh, the many things that enhance it. This is wealth, whether it's money or or tools or flowers, who knows what it is. I think that's good to prosper. I think uh, to do good work, that's something else. I believe that uh, uh, however you define it, that creativity is something that human beings do uniquely on this planet and that it's, it's something most want to do. Bob is about to give his fifth presentation for this weekend, Carl Hess and the Love of Liberty. Well, <clears throat> I started thinking about this shortly after lunch. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> somebody brought up, I don't know why, uh, one of my favorite animals, I guess I brought it up. We have about seven hawks who live on our land. And in watching them, <clears throat> I've often been conscious of something I hadn't been, I hadn't thought about much before, but that fits into the subject this afternoon, the difference between adoration and love. And uh, they're these hawks. And when I look at them, I understand that if I had one of them to dis disassemble, I would really adore the engineering. Because you've got to admit that they're really, they're terrific uh, things. They're great flyers. And you can sort of adore the way they're I, I, aerodynamically fluid and all of that. But there's something else about those hawks. And that doesn't have anything to do with their engineering. It's when you watch them, what I think is you love them. And you're passionately absorbed in, in the fluidity of their flight. <clears throat> and you wish you could be one or spend more time with them. I, I begin to think that there's this great difference between adoration and love. I, I, see, I know a lot of people who adore, I adore my, my Macintosh. It's turning into love, as a matter of fact. Uh, but there is this a very, a great difference. People adore uh, occasionally leaders, for instance. And this gets them into endless, endless problems. Uh, loving is altogether different. I, I'm trying to think of what love is because I want to talk about it. And it does seem to me that it involves this passionate absorption in something. For instance, you may, uh, you may adore the fact that there is music in the world and possibly uh, the modern forms of scoring it. But you really love the music itself. When you listen to music, it's, it's Despite what I've been told by many people, it doesn't strike me that it's an altogether rational uh, process, that you simply respond to it uh, viscerally. That when I listen to music, I've discovered I don't really see text and pictures. I don't see programmatic things. It doesn't, uh, uh, if it hadn't been named the Great Gate at Kiev, I would never see a great gate when the thing was played and so forth.